Ooh, all right. So uh, one of the most asked questions I get when I'm turning up in a onesie on stage is like, or anywhere really, is like, isn't it hard? And the answer is, yeah. Um, besides that, I'll, I'll just walk through real quick because we have a lot to cover. So how are you doing? How's it going? Grüß Gott, Mienchen, right? Squid? Uh, oh, no, that was Swiss. Anyway, um, yeah, wonderful. So um, I'm Martin Splitt. I am from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, yeah, you know, if you have not been to Zurich, you should definitely go there. It has mountains, sure. Yeah, Munich has them as well. But we also have, like, good cheese and good chocolate. And the flag is a big plus as well, I think. Um, <laughs> I am a very serious person. I was born and raised in Germany, so I have no sense of humor. Uh, this is my LinkedIn picture. Um, keeps the recruiters away a bit, just saying, you know, FYI. Uh, I am the head of engineering at a small company in Zurich called Archaeologic. Two of my wonderful coworkers are with me today. Um, and we'll have like a VR, AR, web VR, AR uh, uh, office hours tomorrow. More on that later. And uh, I have the huge pleasure of walking you through um, rendering performance, which is kind of like, you know, the thing that I like to do a lot because I'm a Google Web Developer, a Google Developer Expert for Web Technologies and Polymer. I work with the Mozilla community quite a bit. Uh, I work with the W3C on specs. So if you see a specification that you don't quite understand or don't like or you have questions about, uh, they're all on GitHub. So go to GitHub and submit issues and pull requests. It's very good. If you don't do that, who here has worked with IndexedDB? We you liked it. <laughs> That's what happens when you don't open pull requests. Anyway, um, we also build this thing called 3D.io, which is like a nice platform that helps you build VR and AR content and stuff. And so we're all about performance and 3D content and stuff, and it's really nice. Um, so today, I'm not going to talk about VR and AR. Today, I'm going to talk about the browser rendering pipeline. And I do that because I want to show you on a real-world example, well, real-world-ish example, how rendering performance uh, can be a problem and how we can make things better. And then there's a bit of a quiz where you can win a prize. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, then we're going to have a look at the future, because this is like future of JavaScript. So I have to work in a bit of future stuff that you want to look into and give your comments back to the people working on it and try it out today. All right. Quick prologue, I think to understand rendering performance, we have to understand rendering. And I think one way to understand rendering is to start with pixels. Who here knows what a pixel is? That's amazing. Very well done. We are all good here. No. Um, real quick, so basically a pixel is a tiny little lamp that can have three sub lamps, kind of like you have three different color components. You have red, green, and blue. And you can turn them up in intensity in different ways. So here, for instance, we have our pixie uh, is completely black, so it's sleeping. It's all off. No lights coming from the screen. It's a black pixel. Great. Then we have this wonderful fella. Um, she is green and blue, so that gives this wonderful, is it teal or turquoise or turquoise is the German word. Now you learn German. Go ahead. Have fun with it. Um, you can also do like gray when you just put everything on the same level, then you get gray. And in different, like if you put and pump that up to 66%, it's twice as bright as, a, as this gray. And if you put it up to 100%, then you get white. OK, cool. There's not one pixel, but there's multiple pixels. It took me ages to make this GIF, so I appreciate it now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yay! We don't have time for that. Anyway, um, so let's talk about the rendering pipeline. And the rendering pipeline is like super simple. <laughs> not. So instead of having a look at that and going like, OK, DOM I know, DOM tree, yeah. CSS parser, CSS, I heard before. Uh, style rules, yeah. Render tree layout painting, this what? So instead of like going that and being confused, we're going to walk through this. So let's say we start with this wonderful website. And that's a perfectly valid website. Um, this is how a website looks when it reaches our browser. It comes in over the network as text and image here in this case. And maybe there's some CSS somewhere else, I don't know. And um, so basically, as it comes in, the browser goes, ah, HTML document. Nice, nice. So I'll get my, I'll get my HTML interpreter, who's like, I really imagine him to be here. So I'm like, interpreter, imagine that he's here. Um, so I get my HTML interpreter to kick in. And it's like, OK, there's a document. It has a body. All right, all right. I'm pumped already. 
and uh, there's an H1 element, and it has some text. Cool. And now we have some image, so we have to download that in the background and make, have, make sure that it appears at some point. And it's quite cool because a bunch of image formats have the dimensions in the heads so in the first couple of bytes. So as that arrives, the browser could theoretically, I'm not sure if all browsers do, but theoretically they can figure out how large the image is going to be and then like, use that information later. So now we parse this and we figure out, OK, what do we have here? Right? But this tree structure is not quite what we have on screen. So what we have to do next is we have to figure out, OK, now this h1 element and this image element, how large are these exactly? Because I have to put them on the screen somehow, right? And if I figure out how they are, like how large they are, I have to put them in, because my window has very fi finite dimensions. If it's on a phone, it's probably wider than narrow, depending on how you hold a phone. On a screen, it's probably uh, wider than, than height and all that kind of stuff. So basically, you have to figure out how to fit this all in, right? If the, if the h1 is like a block level element, so it pushes everything below it. Uh, but if there's CSS in the process that makes it like half the size, then maybe the image fits right to it, and all that kind of stuff happens there. So this is what the layout does as well. And then basically it does that by looking at CSS OM, which is like the tree that we haven't seen so far, but it's basically the same as the DOM tree. So we have a tree that says, this is our document. This is the things that we're going to put on, on, on the page. And this is the CSS uh, that tells you how this is going to look like. OK, it looks more or less like this. Yeah. Everyone has seen that because you know that's how our websites look on screen. Not quite, right? So basically, it does not. It hasn't figured out like all the pixels, all the content, all the things. It has only figured out how to put things together and how large everything is and, and like how to fit it in the screen. And that's pretty much it, because there's another another process. Because now that we know where things go, how large they are, so we know how large the text area will be where we put our H1 text. We know how large the image is going to be, so we know how to put the pixels for the image there. We are instructing the browser, or the in browser instructs its painting backend to basically go, ah, right, OK, OK. I have a 100 by 100 pixel image. And then I have this, uh, this text here. It says something, something. It is rendered with this font and this color, has this background color, all that information. And now it starts like painstakingly putting the pixels in. So this means that when I say painting the pixels in, you can see the screen as an array. Because we have identified that the screen is consisting of pixels. And each of these pixels is three lights. So we can use three numbers to represent each of these pixels in memory. So basically, we have a large array where like red, green, blue, red, green, blue happens for each of the pixels on screen. That's great. Um, so now we can basically paint by filling in numbers uh, in this array. So if we change this array, we are painting. We are rendering something on the screen. It's a little more complicated than that. But this is what painting does so far. Now, obviously, it, it is really hard to like, do complicated shapes. So basically, you just work on rectangles because they're a little easier to work with. Um, and these images are usually, uh, sorry, these rectangles are usually called image, texture, or layer, depending on who you ask. If you ask a browser performance engineer or someone who's working with CSS, they probably call it a layer. If you ask someone who's doing like uh, 2D or 3D graphics with engines or the canvas, they probably call it a texture or a sprite sometimes. And if you're asking someone who's not very technical or just can't be bothered, like me, you, you call them images, really. All right, and then we have a bunch of images. So now we painted in this image for the headline. We painted in the image for the actual image. We painted in the rest of the page. And now we have to put them together. That's not painting. That is called compositing. But why do we do this? Why can't we just like paint one thing in one go and have it all on the page? Because this compositing step gives us a bunch of cool things. So for instance, when we want to composite these two, uh, instead of having to like run the calculations uh, immediately, so like imagine this circle came in first, and then at a later stage this circle comes in. Then we have to somehow magically work out that we have to recolor this bit, and it's like that's weird. So that's more or less what uh, compositing does. And this is another example of compositing. So imagine we have two images. We painted them all by putting in all the pixels. That takes a while, right? Getting all the pixels there. And now we have these two images. And by the way, this is a rectangular image. There's just like a few. We use a fourth number to say if this is like visible or invisible or anything in between. This is the alpha channel. It's transparency. So that's how transparency works. You just use a number in addition to the numbers you have for the colors. And what this gives me is, if I want to do complicated things, like moving things around on screen, I don't have to actually put all the pixels together again. I can just use them and put them on top of each other, like you would do with the, with the real old overhead projected slides, right? If you have like these physical plastical, uh, plastic 
um, transparent slides. You can put them on top of each other. That's what cartoons were, were using when they were made in the, in the days. Um, so basically, you put this image, the, the background image, on the screen, and then you put this other image on top of it. And then you just throw it all away. You copy the entire background image again and put this image on a different spot. And you do that all over again at different positions. And if you put that together fast enough, you get nyan, 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 and so on and so forth. Nyan cats. And um, that's what compositing allows. It. Yeah, you can clap if you really feel like that was an accomplishment. Then <laughs> you do you. Um, but how does this work? When I say put things together, that's a concept that makes sense for us as humans. But when you have to program that, how do you program that? How do you make that happen? Well, it depends a bit on how you want to do it, right? So there's one easy way, which is like I take this color, and then I take this color, and I just put them on top of each other. And if they are transparent, then it, it remains the color that we had already. If it's not transparent, then it's the new color. That's a valid blending thing, like a very, very valid way of putting things together. That's absolutely fine. But there's more interesting ways of doing this. Because basically what we can do is we can say, hey, computers, you have this thing called a rendering pipeline. And uh, in a very, 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 very simplified form, it looks like this. I know I say very simplified, but basically, so like two different images go in, a shader runs, and then produces an image on screen. And I know that shader is not necessarily a term that everyone's like, comfortable with, so let's have a look at what the hell a shader is. To understand why shaders are a different thing than normal programs, let's have a real quick look at what the difference between a CPU and a GPU is. Now, CPUs are the brain of the computer. And um, they're like, they have, uh, modern ones have like 16 cores or eight cores, so eight, eight little brains that work on things. Great. Um, but then there's also another brain that is uh, particularly good at doing graphics. So instead of having like the computer do all the thinking for all the like math and input output and all that kind of stuff, and then also do the graphics, we have a different brain that is actually made up of smaller, many, many smaller brains uh, that is called the GPU, the graphics processing unit. So we can offload this work to somewhere else. And this makes sense for a simple reason. So let, have a look at this. So this is, I know there's like four or eight or 16 cores these days, but let's say we have a core that is a single core machine. There's like one CPU, one core, one brain that can do things. And then the GPU here has 16, but real, real world ones have like 1,000 or 2,000 or 100,000. No, 100,000 is like high end, whatever, like a few thousands really. Um, and now you would say, wait, 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 wait. But why would I want this big fat brain here if I can have all these smaller ones and like have many brains? And as a zombie, you're like brains, more brains, good brains. So, but there's a very important difference. So the CPU, because it is directly connected to all the input output and has like a lot of, of really, really intricate electronics and, and things and bits and pieces built in that allow it to predict what the program is going to do, it can do things that you would normally program. You might program something like, OK, I have this loop here. But if the loop loops, like, reads something from memory over there and that value happens to be 5, then I want to write to the memory at a different position another value. So you're basically like changing the flow and the data that it's operating. So it can, can happen that this, this thing, if there's more, more than one brain, this is really hard because you have to figure out, so does, does, the, does the output already exist? Or if the other brain already works on it, does it use old data before the other one has updated it? And how do I make sure that it then processes it again? And, Ooh, that's very complicated. So this thing is really good at predicting the future and like figuring things out, and turbofan and uh, crankshaft and uh, the new Firefox Quantum and all that kind of like, uh, like well, we, are, we are trying to be clever and do more things in parallel. But these pro problems are really, really hard to do in parallel. It's really hard to divide up the work. So all these little fellows, they're like, uh, oh, I think I have to go now. Um, but those are not the only problems that we have to solve. As it turns out, when you work with a race, like the screen is one, you could also say you're working with matrices or matrices, which is like a math thing that you might remember from school and go like, whoa. And, um, but basically, this is what it is. So if we have a lot in graphics, we have a lot of these situations where we have an array, which is one image, and another array, which is another image, and we have to somehow compute this and put this together. So these, these things here, how this works is never turn your audience, like, never turn your back to the audience, but I have a pink fluffy tail, so I'm like, I think it's fine. Um, deal with it. 
so basically how this works is like you start with this value and this value and you put it here and then you take this value and so on and so forth. You basically do this like you do the same operation on different spots. But there's no such thing as if this here is five and this here is seven, then this here is nine. That doesn't happen. Like it, it is always like the same. I take this, I take this, I put it here. I take this, I take this, I put it there and so on and so forth. It's the same operation. It is a lot of data. It's single instruction, multiple data, SIMD if you heard that before. And the cool thing is, because it's the same thing and it does not depend on multiple things beforehand or afterwards, you can put that in parallel. I could give you each one of these cells and you put the number back and then you just go off and you're not like, wait, what, 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 is, what is your number over there? Doesn't happen, right? So now, these tiny little brains here go like, yes, scored it, nailed it, I got this. And the CPU goes, um, how, how far are you all with this? Like, I'm on the third number and they're like, we're done. We're having a coffee. And um, so yeah, these, these GPUs basically benefit from this kind of problems, pr uh, problems. They are designed specifically to deal with this stuff because it happens so often in graphics. And this is what compositing is. I take two numbers, I take the two colors of the two different images, I look at them, I do some math on them, and then I put another number back or another number forward to the screen. So th this is where GPUs come in, really. And this is what it looks in practice. So here we have conveniently as many pixels as we have GPUs. Like, uh, or GPU cores, and uh, we, we ask them to do a thing. So everything is white right now, so nothing has happened so far. So we go, hey, can you take the X and Y position? So can you, this is the X position, like 0, 1, 2, 3, and this is the Y position, 0, 1, 2, 3. Can you take this num these two numbers and uh, multiply them by uh, 85 and then produce an array of three values, red, green, and blue? with these values. There's no dependencies. There's no but if this other thing is something, something. No, no, no. There's no such thing. The inputs determine the outputs. It's a pure function. And it produces this in one go. Whereas the CPU, because it doesn't know if it can do this optimization, goes, all right, so 0, 0, 85, 85, 0, that's nothing. And then I take the next one. Uh -huh. They do it in one go. So that's, and this down here, surprise, surprise, that's a shader. It's a function that is pure enough and operates on data that can be put into the GPU computing to be parallelized uh, and, and, and executed in parallel. All right, now let's have a def different look at this. So basically what we can do with compositing then is, if you think about this like, entire thing as like, m m m adding or, or merging two arrays, then we can do a bunch of things. We can composite different images. We can also um, do like, so no, sorry, we composite multiple images by combining them. We do so using a shader. Let's go through what it does again. Uh, these shaders run on the GPU. And um, the cool thing is these shaders don't just, are not just baked in. There are baked in ones that work for us already, but we can define our own ones with WebGL, for instance. WebGL lets us define our own code that we can run on the GPU, which is super cool. And uh, these are, this is an example of baked-in shaders. So the CSS blend modes are just different ways of combining these two pixel values in different ways. So one is like multiplying it. I think this is multiplication, multiplying the values that it reads. Uh, this one does like more complicated stuff. And then there's other things that invert it and all that kind of stuff. So basically, it's just, just a different function that we run here. And we can do other things as well. We can also just put the, like, put the data or read from the data at different positions and put it into different positions. We can move things around. That's translating. We can move things around and we can rotate them because that's multiplying the values with a rotation matrix. Again, another array, really. Um, we can also scale them up because that's just like reading the same pixel twice or four times or 10 times or only like reading every second pixel, then we're scaling down. So that's just an operation that can be done in parallel as well. And we can blend and filter. So blending we had seen, like this is when, when you uh, put the different image values together, but we could also like the filter basically takes everything that is already done. It takes one value, one color, runs a function over it and produces one color value. So for instance, grayscaling. Grayscaling is a filter mode. Um, if you multiply them by making them like one color multiply with the other color, that is called uh, blending. So these two things exist in CSS. You don't even need JavaScript for it. I know this is a JavaScript conference, but CSS is freaking awesome, so use it when it makes sense. Uh, however, this does not work in all browsers. <laughs> um, Let's pray for betterment there. Uh, this is actually how a shader looks like. It's not JavaScript, as you might have noticed. This is a language called GL slang. It has semicolons and it has types. Deal with it. Um, 
Let's walk through this. So these two are basically variables. This is an array of two, and this is basically an array that, that holds an entire image. And we take them, we get the color value at the coordinate uh, in the image, we sum up the red, green, and blue, we divide by three, get one value, and use that for red, green, and blue. And if we do that, we get a gray value, right? So we had that if every value, if red, green, and blue are the same, then you get a variation between white and black, and all is, is grayscale. So this is the grayscale filter. This is literally what your browser does when you say CSS filter grayscale. That's the grayscale filter. Um, quickly, there's a bit of trouble down the road. So CSS and SVG both have filters. So here, you see an, a CSS example. It blurs. And the dev tools say if there would be like a green flash, that would mean that the pixels had to be re repainted instead of just recompositing things. So this is, this is good. There's no green painting things going on. Nice. This is the same thing in SVG. Let's have a look again. Boom, green. Not quite nice. Um, anyway, so there's like a difference right now. Be aware of this. It's not nice. If you fix it, like submit pull requests to things, then you, I totally buy you a beer because it's fucking awesome. Um, so yeah, there's a few things. There's a few bumps on the road. So let's have a look at a real world example. Here we have a sliding in drawer menu. I know that's like a super real world example, but I couldn't be bothered. Um, so yeah, OK, cool. But that looks pretty good, doesn't it? But have a look at, at the code. OK, so we have a bit of HTML here, and we have a bit of CSS. We position it off the side. And then we have like a transition uh, for the left property. And when it gets active, we move it to left 0, so it pops into the screen, and it transitions over 1.2 seconds. And um, if we have a look at the timeline, all the green means it has been painting pixels. And painting pixels takes a lot of time, so it's slow and it's not nice. So this is what happens when you turn on uh, re uh, re repaint flashing. So Everything that has changed color has repainted. And every time it changes color, it has been repainted. So this repaints a lot, right? This repaints a lot. And I call this the, uh, the repaint disco. <laughs> um, because it has to go through the entire pipeline. So this is what happens. JavaScript ch uh, changes the style, changes the class. The, the style changes the layout. It moves things around. It then has to repaint this, and then it has to composite it on top of it. So that's not very nice. So we basically want uh, to, to not do the painting work. We didn't do layout work. That's pretty good, because it's position absolute, but it's not quite good. But we can do better. Here, I'm doing a translate 3D instead of left. So now, instead of doing like the left transition, I just do something else. And here we go. No more paint disco, right? The timeline is empty here. Nothing's going on in the transition period. That's really nice. And this is what it looked before. So it's a quite a stark contrast. Because we do not longer paint. That's cool. No longer painting, very good. And Paul Lewis once said, oh my god. Paul Lewis once said, this is the art of avoiding work. And here's a real quick quiz. This code, translate x, 0. And then after two, uh, two seconds, we translate to the right. Will this paint? No. No? OK. Uh, it does. Yeah. But why? Martin, you said moving things around is compositing. But I'm, sure, I'm sorry, each of these things, if we want to composite, has to be a separate image. So it takes memory. And imagine every DOM element to be a memory thing. Like, it would be huge. It is already prob probably huge if you have like a large DOM. So the browser goes, no, 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 I don't want to have this cost. So I look at if it makes sense to have layers. And there's a few hints for layers. And one of them is 3D translations, because 3D, you want to have GPU accelerated and keyframe animations and the will change property. If you use these, then this code here, translate 3D, will not paint. OK, and now my time is up, so I'm just going to quickly run through. Ah! There's cool things like the CSS element. There's Houdini, which allows you to pull into this wonderful painting mode things. There's intersection observers and performance observers that give you back feed, like feedback. You get callbacks when things happen in the browser. And please accelerate SVG. And please use GPU for all the things browsers, like Servo tries to do already. And off topic, tomorrow there's our wonderful office, se uh, office session. My coworkers are here with me. We're all in onesies and stuff. And ask us things, show us things. There's a global CFP day if you are an underrepresented group and want to speak. And once he gets awesome, build <laughs> the